Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking a little time out to learn a little bit of something about dementia. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist over at Laureate. We're going to talk about dementia, but we're also going to talk about it in relation to some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms that have come about due to dementia and what you might be able to do about those. So you'll, you'll see the, the title slide talking about dementia is dementia is dementia. I, I, I meant that to mean that eventually all dementias look pretty much alike. We'll learn a little bit later as we talk about some of these how timing of symptoms, what symptoms present first, what symptoms present later, will give you some idea of what type of dementia it actually is. If you see the little letters there, the MNCD, it's major neurocognitive disorder, which is the new term for dementia. Dementia is still acceptable, but if you see someone that has major neurocognitive disorder, realize that they have dementia. It's just something that has kind of been cleaned up and renamed with the uh, onset of ICD-10 ICD and the Diagnostic Statistic Manual of Psychiatry. Uh, number five. So dementia, I always try to get this slide in as early as possible. Dementia is an umbrella term that's used to describe a range of symptoms with cognitive impairment. So, you know, I will say this, that people with Alzheimer's all have dementia, but people with dementia don't always have Alzheimer's. So you, you might have Alzheimer's, you may have vascular, you may have Lewy body, you may have frontal temporal. So these are things that define what type of dementia you have. So each part of that umbrella might be a different spot. Obviously, Alzheimer's is number one on the list. Vascular is number two. Lewy body is coming up number three. Uh, so if you have someone with Alzheimer's, typically early on, they have memory deficit and some word finding difficulty. Vascular dementia, you typically think of people who have stepwise decline. Lewy body dementia up front, they have a lot of problems with visual hallucinations. Frontal temporal dementia up front, usually have one of two things, either behavioral disinhibition or they will have marked, marked difficulty with their speech. Just a few statistics, just to make sure that everybody understands the impact of Alzheimer's. You know, globally, this is a global issue. We always talk about problems in America. This is a global issue. Worldwide, people are developing Alzheimer's at astonishing rates. And according to some Alzheimer's Association uh, data, about every three seconds, someone develops dementia. Unfortunately, every three seconds, someone's not getting diagnosed with dementia and getting in and getting early on some of the medications that they need in order to maybe stave off the bad effects of dementia. So keeping in mind early diagnosis and accurate diagnosis may save you years of being able to be at home. General characteristics of dementia, you know, these aren't necessarily symptoms of dementia, but characteristics of dementia, it has to represent a decline from a previous level of functioning. You know, someone has to decline in their memory. Someone has to decline in their IQ even. So, you know, you have to be demented or you have to be minted to be demented. The onset is gradual. Someone doesn't develop dementia overnight in a week, in a month. Uh, it takes a year to, to two to three years before you start to see the symptoms of dementia. It represents a global impairment. People not only have memory problems, if you just have a memory problem and nothing else, then you typically don't have a dementia. Uh, you have to have memory plus some other symptoms, ability to speak, ability to reason, ability to plan. It's always progressive. If you have a diagnosis of dementia, it's going to get worse. There's nothing that you can do to stop it from getting worse. There's nothing I can do to stop it from getting worse. These are folks that over time are going to continue to decline and continue to get worse and worse and worse. The last thing about dementia is it can't be diagnosed if someone has a delirium. So someone who is under the influence of drugs can't be diagnosed. Someone who has an infection can't be diagnosed. Someone who's had an acute medical uh, illness or post-surgical that's now confused can't be diagnosed until that delirium has cleared up. And once that delirium's cleared up, then you can look at their symptoms and make some determinations of whether or not they have dementia on top of that. So the core symptoms, as we talked about earlier, you know, those are the general characteristics. These are the core symptoms. If you don't have a memory problem, you're not demented. You know, early on, some, some of the memory problems are very mild, but cognition and memory are the hallmark of dementias. They are the category one. You have to have a cognitive problem. In addition to a cognitive problem, sometimes you have language problems. Language problems can be the ability to find the right word where somebody stumbles on a word or has difficulty in finding the right word for the right situation or makes up words. So you have that sort of language problem. <clears throat> Some people have language problems where they can't make the words, period. They, they just become mute. 
And early on, you can see this basically with word finding problems in Alzheimer's, that there are certain types of the frontal, uh, frontal temporal dementia that pr primary progressive aphasia or a worsening of their ability to speak is one of the first symptoms you'll see. They also have a decline in their ability to do things, what they used to know how to do, fix stuff, cook, run a machine, remote controls, cell phones, suddenly become foreign to them. They can't do that, even if it's something they've had for a while. You throw something new in there to them, then they even have more difficulty in, in managing that device. And you have to ask about those things. There's questions about how they interact with their activities or instruments of activities of daily living, you know, how they use the telephone, how they use the TV, how they use the microwave. And those things are very important when you start to look at what kind of safety uh, effects that this dementia might have for them, what sort of placement they might need, what sort of in-home care they might need, should they still be able to drive, should they still be able to cook on their own, all of those things are kind of looked at and have to have decisions made about them. Recognition, usually not early on, but later on, you will have folks who lose the ability to recognize someone for who they are, or they mistake them for someone that's similar to them. Sometimes their wife will become their mother-in-law. Sometimes their children will become their sister. You know, I, I see people almost on a daily basis who have lost the ability to recognize who their spouse is. And, you know, it, it's sad but it's also can be dangerous when you think that someone that's strange is in your house and you become frightened with that, call the police, try to attack them. All those things have occurred and occur reg regularly with someone who has advanced dementias. Functioning, simple things like bathing, dressing, feeding themselves can become problems later on with dementia. If you look at your children, when they were very young, you know, they couldn't walk. They learned to crawl, then they learned to walk. They couldn't use a fork and a knife so they ate with their hands. They couldn't drink out of a cup so they used a straw or they used a bottle. So all of those things with, with advanced dementias, especially Alzheimer's dementia, kind of go in reverse where you have someone who regresses and starts to show those childhood traits, those infantile traits as their brain stops working on the cognitive level. Planning, the ability to think through something, plan through something, become very, very disruptive to folks. They can't seem to get the organizational skills. You know, some people, if you're reading about dementias, you'll see the term executive functioning. This is what I'm talking about by executive function, the ability to think through something, plan something, reason through something. And this is something that can be very telling if someone wants to drive and still thinks they can drive. Unfortunately, I've never met anyone with dementia who didn't think they were a good driver, but your ability to plan, your ability to navigate, your ability to react quickly to certain changes, or uh, they always say, well, they only drive in their neighborhood, they only drive to the store, and that's fine until there's a road construction somewhere and they have to move here to there or they have to change their route from here to there. So those sort of things can really throw people off. And the last thing that you will often see with people with dementia is their inability to recognize that they have a problem. Sometimes they don't know that they don't know. They will argue that they're fine. And then two minutes later, they'll argue that they're fine. And then two minutes later, they'll argue that they're fine because there's nothing wrong with them. They've lost that insight. They've lost that ability to recognize themselves as someone who has a problem. Now, early on, you don't always see that. But later on, I have people in my office that will argue with their, their loved one that brings them in or argue with me that they shouldn't be there, that there's nothing wrong with them, that it's everybody else causing the problem. So moving on from just general symptoms and core symptoms to the neuropsychiatric symptoms, and this is typically where my phone starts to ring. You know, primary care can take care of this, neurology can diagnose this, and we'll talk about some of the things that you should have done if you're getting a diagnosis. But when the neuropsychiatric symptoms start to pop up, that's usually where the geropsych gets called or our inpatient unit gets called because someone is, is needing an inpatient level of care or having difficulty managing, <clears throat> they're having difficulty managing their loved one at home through these things. You know, depression. I list depression first because early on when someone has the diagnosis of dementia, still has insight of what's going on, especially if they've had a spouse or a loved one or a sibling 
that has had dementia and it's gone through dementia, depression is a very common thing. You know, classic symptoms of depression, sadness, tearfulness, loss of interest in activities, difficulty with their sleep, with their appetite, with their motivation, difficulty with feelings of hopelessness, worthlessness, in very severe cases, difficulty with thoughts of not wanting to be alive and sometimes even thoughts of suicide. So those things, any, anytime someone has dementia, they need to be screened for depression. Anytime someone has depression, they need to be screened for dementia. Depression, especially first onset depression late in life, is always suspicious for someone who's developing a dementia illness. It's also always uh, suspicious for someone who's developing Parkinson's. So depression is something that needs to be looked at. If they've had depression throughout their life, off and on, it's less concerning that, that they get depressed when they're older. But older folks with depression need to be looked at very closely and monitored very closely for cognitive effects. There are some people who get so depressed that they look demented. Their concentration gets bad. They can't speak as well. They're so slow. They're near catatonic. And sometimes those people get misdiagnosed with uh, dementia, but in, in listening to the families, a lot of times they will convince you that they were fine a few months ago, and now they look demented. And as we talked earlier, they're not demented if they were fine two months ago. Sleep disturbance is a big, a big complaint I see and a big problem that I hear about. But really, with sleep disturbance, the first thing you need to kind of get at is one expectations about sleep. If you're 80 years old, you don't sleep 10 hours a night. You don't sleep nine hours a night. You may sleep seven hours a night, and it's not always solid sleep. There's a lot of factors at that point that keep people awake. You know, there, there's a term called sleep efficiency. It's time in bed versus time asleep, and their sleep efficiency goes way down. Sometimes it has to do with pain being uncomfortable. Sometimes it has to do with having to get up and use the restroom several times throughout the night. Sometimes it is to do with they're anxious, they worry, and they can't go to sleep. You know, sleep hygiene is the best way to address this, and sleep hygiene is very simple. You need to have scheduled sleep times. You try to need to go to bed similar times every night. You need to get up similar times every morning. And, you know, if you figure that someone can get six to seven hours of sleep and they're going to bed at eight o'clock at night, they're going to be awake at three in the morning and ready to get up and no one's ready for them to get up. And it becomes disruptive to the families. It becomes disruptive because they get up and they want to get dressed. They want to go and they don't really need to do that. So sleep hygiene, making sure there's scheduled sleep times, awake times, making sure the environment for sleep is adequate reclaiming the bed just for sleep. You don't lay in bed and watch television. You don't lay in bed and read a book. You don't lay in bed and look at your TV or, or, or your uh, computer or your cell phone screen because the light from those things, hopefully everybody that does that has the low light levels on because the light from those things themselves will make you awake. You don't exercise right before you go to bed at night because that will raise your uh, or increase your difficulty in going to sleep. So a comfortable environment, quiet environment. If you need background noise because it's noisy around where you live, then some sort of white noise machine or fan can sometimes be beneficial. You know, medications for sleep are always a difficult thing, and that's something that anyone who takes any medicine for sleep should discuss that with their prescriber, their physician, their nurse practitioner, their PA, and make sure that what they're taking is appropriate for their sleep. It's not going to interfere with any of their medications, because if someone has to get up several times at night to use the restroom and you give them something that's too sedating, you're going to increase the risk for falls. And if people fall, bad things happen, things get broken, things get hurt, and they end up in the hospital. Anxiety is another thing that a lot of folks have. Sometimes it's pre-morbid or, or exists prior to these things. Sometimes it's after these things happen. But anxiety is typically worrying about stuff, fretting about stuff, usually things that aren't that unrealistic that worry about family. One of the huge things I see in older folks is they worry about running out of money. Some folks that have had falls before worry about falling again. And the anxiety can be very crippling. The anxiety can interfere with their ability to think and their ability to remember, their ability to sleep. So anxiety is something that has to be looked at very seriously when someone is getting screened initially for an office visit and they could possibly have dementia. After you get past those, things start to get a little bit more difficult as far as dangerous. Agitation is a huge one. As I said, you know, if you don't recognize the person that you live with, that you've lived with for 60 years, you know, you're scared. Sometimes you get agitated. If you've been told you can't drive, but you think you drive well and the spouse has the keys and you're trying to get the keys, agitation can become a part of it. There's a very common term that's used in Alzheimer's called sundowning. 
which typically means this agitation and some of these symptoms occur a little bit more often in the evenings and the late afternoons, but sometimes agitation can happen any time of day. I always tell people they need to have a diversionary task ready. If someone gets agitated and they like to play cards, have a deck of cards ready. If someone's agitated and they love to look at old pictures, I always tell people to have a picture album ready so they can look at it and not pictures from last Christmas, pictures from 50 years ago of folks that they knew then wedding pictures, things that take them back so they can use their remote memory, which a lot of times is the last thing to go. Wandering is a huge issue. I, I'm hyper alert to seeing the signs that say silver alert, you know, and it always tells what kind of car they drive. And I don't know what kind of car my patients drive, but when I see a silver alert on Twitter or a silver alert on the news, I always wait for the name or the picture and hope that it's not some of mine, because this is something that every patient that I see is part of the discussion is safety. And one of the things that, that develops safety is them not being able to get up in the middle of the night and wander outside. You know, a lot of times it's benign. They go to the neighbor's house, they knock on the door, the neighbor knows that they've got problems, they get back. But there have been several times where people have wandered out into traffic and got hit and killed. So it's a very, very serious thing. You know, the technology now is a little bit easier with, with webcams and automatic locks and things along those lines that keep people kind of where they need to be. I always tell this story because it is my great aunt in California. Uh, my uncle Troy had developed dementia and he had more of a vascular dementia and had a open heart surgery, cabinet or coronary bypass. And when he got out from under that and off the pump, his dementia was a lot, lot worse. And he loved to get up in the middle of the night and just leave. He would leave their home and walk around. And you know, you always heard the term necessities of the mother invention. My aunt Betty would safety pin his pajamas to the bed sheet. And so when he tried to get up, it would wake her up. She could calm him back down. He'd go back to bed. So to keep people from wondering, like I said, necessity is the mother invention and whatever works for you to keep someone from wondering, that's fine. Paranoia, again, later on, you start to see a lot of paranoia. It usually involves stuff being taken from them, stolen from them. And the other part of paranoia can be the fear that they're gonna get put in a nursing home, that the family is plotting against them and planning to put them away and planning to do this. So paranoia by definition is unreasonable. It's something that is not founded in reality. So the fact that someone is stealing from them usually in, in almost all cases is that they fear someone is stealing from them, hide something so it won't get stolen and they can't remember where it was. I had a patient uh, that Every night, someone would come into her bedroom and steal her little area rug that sat by her bed that she would use. Every morning, the family would get the call that someone had been in the house and stole that. Then the family would go over and go to the back of the closet, get the rug back out, because every night before she went to bed, she would roll the rug up and hide it in the closet because she thought someone was going to come in and steal it. Of course, in the morning, Sure enough, someone had came in and stole it. So again, you know, the paranoia and thinking things are going on is not reasonable. And I will tell you now, you know, and we'll talk about some of the interventions. There's no reason to argue about that. There's no reason to try to convince them that someone didn't steal that and that the family had learned that. They just went over and got it back out and put it back out for, and then, you know, it's like 51st Dates, the movie. The next day they do the same thing over and over again. Hallucinations, again, one of the scary parts. This is when the phone rings rather quickly. Uh, the, the hallucinations can be typically visual hallucinations where they see stuff. And as I said earlier, Lewy body dementia tends to have that very early on, but Alzheimer's dementia can also have that. It's usually a later occurring effect. It's usually visual hallucinations where they see stuff. And it's, it's always been odd to me, and I have no real explanation for this, but older women with dementia typically see families. They see a mom and kids usually young children that are living in their house. And they're very matter of fact about it. They might call their, their, their loved one and say, you know, hey, you know, there's this family living in my house. I guess they needed a place to stay for the night. And most people that didn't have dementia would wake up with a family living in their house. It wouldn't be calm and collected. It would be calling the police and running out of the house for fear of what's going on. You know, and of course, by the time the family gets over there, the patient will say, well, they left. I guess they got tired of waiting. They got up and left. I have a couple of patients who every night at dinner, they have to sit, they're just a couple, they have to set five places at the table. 
because there's three people that live in that house that are going to come to dinner. And, and the husband has learned there's no reason to argue. There's no reason to set it for four people or three people. He sets, the, he sets the table for five people. If they don't show up, that's fine. But the wife gets very, very upset if the table's not set for five. So again, he's learned not to argue. He's learned to adapt. He's learned to overcome some of the challenges that he has when it comes to taking care of his wife that has dementia. Wanted to kind of stop and talk about depression just a little bit more in, in light of apathy you know, apathy, the lack of desire to do something. Early on, as I said, with Alzheimer's and certain types of dementia, they can be depressed. Later on with dementia, it's typically always a symptom of apathy where they just don't want to do stuff. They don't care about this. They don't want to bathe. They don't want to shower. And then that's where they'll start arguing. Well, I, I took a shower already today. Well, in reality, they haven't taken a shower already today. And at some point, you know, you don't fight that battle. But there are other points where it's been two weeks and they've had some skin breakdown and they have to get in the shower. And so they have to be put in the shower, which leads to more agitation, which leads to my phone ringing, which leads to admission. Because I will say here before we go any further, there's never been a patient that I know of that got admitted to assisted living, a memory care unit or a nursing home just because they had a bad memory. It's because they had one of these things here, these neuropsychiatric symptoms. When you look at the grading of dementia, you know, you'll see things, they'll call it mild, moderate to severe to profound. You'll see, you know, stage zero to seven C, a lot of things like this. In the McAdams terminology, there's two divisions of dementia, the tolerable and the intolerable. The tolerable is memory, the tolerable is depression, sleep disturbances, anxiety. The intolerable starts to become the agitation, the wondering, the violence, the paranoia, the hallucinations. So again, you know, the tolerable part people put up with, and that is why people don't come to the doctor because it's tolerable, it's just memory. We just remind dad that, you know, this is that and that's this. And, you know, we put out his meds for him and make sure that this is set up and that's set up. All his bills are, are online and they're automatically debited from his account. His social security check goes in, his pension check goes in. So he doesn't have to navigate a lot of that. They do it as well as they can. But then by the time one of these things pop up, memory is past the point of being able to be intervened on appropriately to keep someone from progressing any faster than they have to. So types of dementia. You know, number one on the list is Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is a, an illness that was first identified and written about in 1907 by a German neuropathologist named Alois Alzheimer. He had a 50-year-old female as a patient who showed odd signs of memory loss at a very early age. Of course, 50 back in 1907 wasn't that early of age. And when he did the autopsy, he found these unusual plaques and tangles in her brain that he called Alzheimer's disease. And so now we're 100 years to 2007 and another 15 more to our six or 14 more to 2021 and Alzheimer's is still what it's called. So if you have someone who has early onset memory problems, who has difficulty with a uh, short term memory, with has difficulty with getting the right words out, you know, don't wait until it becomes intolerable. Go in, get seen, take uh, your notes into the doctor and let him know what the heck is going on. Lewy body tends to get in a little quicker because those hallucinations scare people. Sometimes it scares the patient that has them, but it certainly scares the family members or the loved ones or the caregivers because these hallucinations to them are, are to the patient is very real. Sometimes they're very scary. I had a patient uh, not too long ago that dove out of bed at night because he thought it was on fire because he saw fire on his bed. It wasn't on fire, but he thought it was. You know, you see these folks that have these very vivid descriptions of things that have happened, you know, people in the trees, gorillas in the trees, people hanging from the trees. I've, I've heard these very eloquent descriptions of these hallucinations that no one else sees. They're the only ones that sees them. Frontal temporal dementia, we talked about earlier. These are the ones that have a lot of behavioral disinhibition. When you look at what our frontal lobe does, in most people, it's our filter, it's our social filter. We might think it, but we don't say it. You know, the other vernacular, you always see the, the mock-ups where there's an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder. 
Well, the angel's the cortex of our brain, the devil's our midbrain. And with dementias and frontal temporal dementias, that cortex, especially the frontal cortex, starts to, to shrivel and starts to shrink and doesn't do its job. So the devil is getting hurt a lot more. So impulsivity is, is a classic hallmark of this. Inappropriate behavior, sexually inappropriate behavior, inappropriate speech, suggestive behavior is part of this. Now that's that's one type of frontal temporal dementia. The other one is the one that has the early onset difficulty in speaking where they literally can't get words to come out right. If you've ever seen one, someone who's had a bad stroke, they can't talk, they just mumble or their words are just in a, in a salad almost. This is very similar to what this is. And a lot of times these people have said will get the initial diagnosis of primary progressive aphasia, which means they think the aphasia is the primary symptom, but it, it, it if it lasts long enough, they know. If they last long enough, then they know that it has problems with dementia and vascular dementia. So vascular dementia, as I said earlier, has to do with circulation in the brain. They don't have good circulation in the brain. They've had micro infarcts. They've had small vessel disease that have caused little strokes here and there that when they start to add up, it starts to affect memory. Typically, we were taught when I was in medical school and when I was a resident that vascular dementia, and back then it was called multi-infarct dementia, represented a stepwise decline in functioning, that everything would be okay for a while, that something would happen, everything would be okay for a while, something would happen. And that typically is how it looks, but sometimes those things that happen are just salient points on a straight line that slopes down. And they're just something that people remember, like, well, you know, grandpa was doing pretty good, but then he started hallucinating. Grandpa was doing pretty good from that. And then he started fighting with grandma. So you're thinking, well, that's a stepwise decline when in reality it's not. Typically, when you do a workup or a diagnostic testing for these folks, you will see things on their MRI or their CT scan that will give you some pause to think that this may be a vascular dementia. Sometimes it's very difficult to know if it is truly vascular dementia or Alzheimer's on top of it. And the combination certainly can occur. Parkinson's disease is very similar to Lewy body. In reality, it's probably the same illness, just a different point on the spectrum of the progression of that illness. Lewy body dementia is typically the hallucinations occur up front. Most of the time they have mild Parkinson's symptoms. About 25% of the time they don't have Parkinson's symptoms. And Parkinson's patients usually have Parkinson's disease two or three years before they start to develop dementia. The Parkinson's patients on autopsy do have Lewy bodies in the brain. Parkinson's patients can have significant visual hallucinations. You've seen the commercials on television for New Plazid, where the guy is painting and he sees two dogs laying over there and, and talks about that. So, so Parkinson's disease can have a lot of visual hallucinations as well. Huntington's disease is a little rare. And those of you who know about Huntington's know that it's something you don't want. It's an autosomal dominant, which means if one of your parents have it, you have a 50-50 chance of getting it. It is something that is pretty rapid in deterioration, causes a lot of movement problems, and it's something that is always terminal. Prion illness, I always mention prions because... You know, I gave blood recently and they wanted to know if I'd lived in Europe during a certain period of time because there was a lot of mad cow disease going over there at the time. If you're a cow and you have a prion illness, you have mad cow disease. If you're a human and you have prion illness, most likely you have Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease. And it is probably the one thing that defies that gradual onset. These people have a rapid decline in their memory. They have a rapid decline in their functioning. They have marked changes of atrophy on their brain. And they have some characteristic changes on their EEG pattern, their electroencephalogram, when you look at the brain waves. And they also have a lot of jerking movements that are called uh, myoclonus. So if you see someone who has a rapid onset of dementia with some of those associated symptoms, then those are folks that you might consider that they have a prion illness. The main thing with prion illness that you want to know about is that they have it because it is something that can be transmitted between humans. So you don't want to be having blood products from them or anything along those lines. And the last one is CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I think the NFL has made this one pretty famous. People who have repeated head injuries, repeated concussions, repeated force injuries to the brain develop long-term changes. And when they have enough of that, they can develop a lot of dementia as well. 
Sometimes when you do the workup for these folks, it is not something that you typically see on MRI. It's mostly seen during autopsy, and there's a lot of research going on that in Boston, where a lot of the ex-NFL players and athletes have been donating their brains for a post-mortem exam or autopsy exam to try to better understand this. Obviously, the best thing to do to keep this from happening is not have brain injury. Now, sometimes that's, that's, that's part of just an accident, but repeated brain injury, and you know, I know the NFL has put a lot of money into helmets. I know that NFL does a lot of research on this, but when you bash your head into another person too many times, sooner or later, it's going to come at you. It's going to come at you. So how do you know? How do you know you have dementia? Well, the biggest, the biggest thing is your suspicion of dementia. You know, and, and as I said, you know, once it gets down the road, your suspicion of dementia is gone because you don't know that you have it. And then you have to rely on other people's suspicion of, 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 the, uh, of the fact that your memory's failing or that you're doing odd things or you started to hallucinate. But the main thing is see your doctor early. Get in there as quick as you feel like there's memory problems and be insistent. Take take in notes, take in your loved one and, and have some things ready of why you're concerned, why you feel that you have dementia. Because I've heard it too many times and it's probably come out of my mouth. Well, you know, it's probably just your age, but age is not an excuse for being demented. Age might be an excuse for having a little bit of a slow memory at times or having an occasional struggle with this or that, but it's not something that you can say just because you're old, your memory's bad. You have to make sure it isn't. So be insistent. The best way to fight this is get an early, accurate diagnosis. If you have an early diagnosis of Alzheimer's, you can do some things with certain medications that we'll talk about in a little bit that may well slow down the progression. It won't stop the progression. It won't reverse things. Hopefully there's some things in the pipeline that might eventually do that. But right now, the best we can do is tap the, tap the brakes a little bit and slow it down. So get that early accurate diagnosis, be insistent with your doctor, not rude, but insistent. As a physician, I will tell you, you know, if you bring me in a 10 page letter, that's not going to be as good as a one page document that has some bullet points on it because doctors don't always have time to sit down and read 10 pages when they have 30 minutes to see you or 15 minutes to see you. So the more concise you can make it and the more impactful you can make it, the better off you will be in your physician's office. So what can you do? Well, one thing you can do is, is develop your cognitive reserve. When you're in a plane and something goes wrong with your plane, you wanna be as high up in the air as you can be. That gives you more time to try to fix stuff. It gives you more time to try things before you get to a point where you're dangerous or in danger. So the same way with, with uh, dementia, the more cognitive reserve you have, the better off you're going to be. So how do you get cognitive reserve? Well, one of the things you can do to get cognitive reserve is be always learning things, being a person who's inquisitive and wants to know new things, reading things, watching things, going to places, doing things, uh, interacting, you know, with things that not only your brain has to learn, but your body has to come along with. So, you know, dance lessons can be something that's important. Learning a new language can be important. Learning an instrument can be important. If you already play an instrument, learning new music can be important. So developing that cognitive reserve and having that cognitive altitude is always an important thing when it comes to fighting dementia because it takes it longer to be affected. It takes it longer to come to a point where you start to have those neuropsychological things and it becomes longer before someone is talking about whether you need an assisted living or not. Once you have it and even before you have it, the best thing you can do to try to slow it down is have a healthy heart. So if you have high blood pressure, control it. If you have diabetes, control it. If you have high cholesterol, control it. If you smoke, stop it. All of those things are damage your heart. As we talked about, the vasculature in your brain is very similar to the vasculature in your heart. So you develop vascular problems on top of dementias and it causes the decline to become even quicker. Other things you can do is be social, interact. Humans are typically a social thing, and that's why it's always nice when we have these here. They have a nice meal. People come and talk. They see people they haven't seen in a while. It's important. So socialize and interact is very important. You know, playing bridge is not only something that's good for your brain. It's something that gives you a social outlook. 
And I realize that bridge is not something a lot of people play, but I do have folks who are very, very devout bridge players and want to go. Socialization at church, activities at church, you know, groups that go to museums, anything that you can think of that's going to stimulate you and stimulate your brain and allow you to be around people are good. Alzheimer's Association is a valuable, valuable uh, asset to anyone who has any type of dementia. It just doesn't have to be Alzheimer's disease. If you have frontal temporal dementia, if you have Lewy body dementia, if you have anything that causes a cognitive decline, the Alzheimer's Association is there for you. ALZ.org, those of you who are computer savvy, that's how you get there. There will be a local link. You can call. They have caregiver classes. They have ideas on respite care where you can take someone for a day while you need to go to the doctor, you need to do that. Trying to involve family, you know, as well to get some respite, to get some help, to get things like that because caregivers and caregiver support is a big thing. As I said, no one goes to the nursing home, no one goes to assisted living, no one goes to memory care because they have a memory problem. They go because the, they have problems that the caregiver can no longer tolerate them. They can no longer function with them at home. The caregiver is underwater. The caregiver is struggling. The caregiver is depressed. The caregiver has all of these things wrong with them. And their sole point in life is being able to take care of their spouse that has dementia. And they don't take care of themselves. You know, there's study after study that show that people with chronic men uh, medical illness that's a caregiver for a demented patient, their medical illnesses are worse. Their diabetes is worse. Their hypertension is worse. They have more prone. They're more prone to stroke. They're more prone to injury from lifting, grabbing, tugging. All those things can be something that with extra help, <clears throat> excuse me, with extra help with family being involved, then there's a time for that person to do something for themselves. I think We've unfortunately have heard over the past COVID year, the term self-care, where we try to take some time to take care of ourselves, whether it's through meditation, whether it's through massage, whether it's through just being somewhere where you can be by yourself. Those are things that can be important for someone who has a caregiver as well. Legal aspects. Again, that early diagnosis can give you time to talk to the person that has the illness to talk about their wishes what they want to do, what end of life care they want. And the other thing that can be very important at this time is to uh, execute a power of attorney that will come into play uh, if someone diagnoses them with an illness that allows them, that doesn't allow them to make decisions correctly for themselves. Because once they are in a hospital that they've been diagnosed with dementia, power of attorney is not something that you can execute because they don't have the ability to understand the document and the ability to sign. Then you have to go through guardianship hearings and that's expensive. You have to get an attorney, you have to appear before a judge. So those are things that can be very difficult and very time consuming. So putting that power of attorney in place, putting that living will in place, putting that end of life care in place can be very important and eliminate a lot of concerns once that time comes of trying to make a decision of whether or not to do this procedure, whether or not to do this test, or whether or not to put them on a ventilator. All of those things can be very important to know in advance because it's a very difficult decision to make when you're faced with that, where the doctor walks out and says, you know, we got to put him on a ventilator or we got to put her on a ventilator or they're going to die. And if you know, because you've talked to them, they don't want to be on a ventilator, it's a lot easier decision to make. Always have plan B. You know, right now, living at home is what you want them to do, but you need to at least know what your options are and some places that you've looked at just in case plan B needs to be implemented. When some of those intolerable symptoms come along, some of those neuropsychological symptoms come along and you need to move somewhere, you need to place someone, it's always nice to have a couple in the bank that you know, that you visited, that you have checked on pricing, that you've checked on the fact that you feel comfortable with your, your loved one there. You know, never pick anything out of a magazine. I know it's probably been tough over the past years as far as going and tour places, but go and tour places. Smell the place. See if it looks clean. See if the people are well-dressed and, and clean. Make sure that everyone looks like they're happy. Make sure they have activities. Make sure they have a activities director. All of those things can be important when you go. And, and if they're female, make sure they have a beautician. A lot of them have little beauty shops there or someone that comes in and does hair. Because that can be very important because that has been a routine thing that they've had for the past 40 years is on Tuesdays, they get their hair done. So do that. Medications is what I kind of say for last because it's, I guess, technically a bit of the saddest part of this because there's not a lot of medications 
that we talk about when it comes to what you can do about this stuff. As I said early on, you can use some medications. I'm sure that most of you have heard a few of the names. Aricept, Exelon are two of the most common ones. There's a patch that's Exelon. But these are medicines that can potentially slow down, delay the time that someone can, or increase the time that someone can be at home, delay the time that someone needs to be placed. And so looking at that from a standpoint of doing something, you can. There's another one called Namenda Momentine that is similar in, in it, that it slows things down. So with talking about what you can do for just the dementia part, it's just important to talk about what you shouldn't do for the dementia part. And, you know, one of the hallmark neurotransmitters in the brain that's related to memory and that's shown to be low in people with dementia is a, is a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. Not important that you know that, but it's important that you know that there are medicines that you can buy over the counter that can decrease it further. And when you have someone who has a little bit of a decrease and you go get the wrong medicine over the counter and give it to them, then you're going to get into real trouble real quick. So I always tell people anything with the PM on the end of it, Tylenol PM, Motrin PM, anything that's over the counter for sleep with the exception of melatonin, stay away from it. It can make things a lot worse, a lot quicker. And when you talk about that delirium we talked about earlier, it's much easier for someone who has a dementia already to become delirious. So you give someone who just got a little bit of memory problem because they're not sleeping well and you get some Tylenol PM and give it that to them for a few nights. And the next thing you know, they're seeing things and they're agitated and they're aggressive. So those are things that you need to really, really, really stay away from. So anytime that you go in and you have a patient that's on dementia, I would recommend you use the same pharmacy for all their meds because that pharmacist has the, uh, the pharmacy ledger up there that he can look in on the computer and see, all right, you're on this, this, and this, and you want to take this, and you've got a diagnosis of that. That's not a good idea. You shouldn't use that. Let's try this. Most importantly, even talking to the pharmacist is talking to the physician that's prescribing the rest of your medications. You know, here at St. Francis Healthcare System, we use the EPIC electronic health record, which cross checks all medications with each other and, and looks for, for problems, flags us, tells us, are you really sure you want to do this with this or that dose is a little high. So if you're, if you're getting something in one place and everybody knows what it is, your care is going to be a lot better. Because before we had these electronic health records, older people might have four or five specialists that they're seeing and each one of them treating something a little bit differently. You know, they're sleep, they're having trouble sleeping at night. So, you know, their rheumatologist gives them this, their psychiatrist gives them that, their orthopedist gives them the other thing. And most folks are very compliant with their medication, very adhered to their medication. So suddenly they're taking three things for sleep at night and the family's wondering why they won't wake up the next day or why they're so foggy or why they're falling all the time. And it's because they're on the wrong medication. So again, one med list, one chart, it's always better to be able to look at that to avoid those pratfalls of being on too much medication or too much of the wrong medication. So the other thing with meds are, are the neuropsychiatric symptoms. If someone has problems with depression, then you use antidepressants. Same antidepressants you would use if you had major depression. Typically, the ones that are used most commonly are, are the, the group called SSRIs, and that can be the Prozacs, the Zolofs, the Lexapro, the Selexas. Those, those are, are very commonly used in older folks that have problems with uh, the uh, depression. Anxiety, very similar medications are used for that. The difficulty in anxiety is trying not to use Xanax or Valium or Ativan. Sometimes you have to, but if you don't, then that's better because one, they can cause falls. Two, they cause cognitive dulling even further and you don't need help with that. So you wanna to try to avoid those as much as you can. When it starts to come to the agitation and hallucinations, anything that I prescribe, anything that any other doctor prescribes is technically off label. There's no Federal Drug Administration's uh, recommendations for using any medications for agitation and psychosis associated with dementia. And most of the medicines that we use, there's a, there's a warning that it may increase overall mortality. 
by 1.6 to 1.7 percent. So with those medicines, there's always the risk that you can do harm and we try not to do harm. And sometimes that's the only thing that, that will get them to not hallucinate. Those medicines, you might hear the term Zyprexa or Olanzapine, or uh, Seroquel or Quetiapine, Respiradol or Respiradone are very common ones that are used in these situations. So if you have someone who's psychotic, someone who's hallucinating, someone who's agitated beyond the point of being able to be redirected or controlled, sometimes those medications have to be used. And again, they're off-label. They have some some severe warnings, but they're really one of the few options that are available. The other thing I will tell you, and you know, Prevagen won't hurt you, but it won't help you. You know, they have that very nice commercial talking about how it's made out of uh, jellyfish and how natural it is, but there's not any studies. And when you look at these medicines like that at the very end, there's a little thing down at the bottom that says the FDA has not studied this, has not approved it, and anything they're saying is pretty much anecdotal. So. You know, the only thing that will hurt you with Prevagen is your pocketbook. Anything that you take with Prevagen is not going to help with your cognition. If it does, it might as well be a Tic Tac, might do the same if you thought it was going to help. A lot of placebo effect with, with medicines like that. So don't waste your money on Prevagen. Avoid the over-counter medications that help you sleep and talk to your doctor about any medication changes that you make or any over-the-counter medications that you are thinking about taking or are going to take because that can keep you out of trouble and keep you a little bit better a little bit longer. I think that's the last question or that's the last slide. So we'll look at questions now. I don't know if any have been typed in. I know I don't think anyone's interrupted me. So there about, there'll be times I'll be looking away from the camera and that's just maybe to check something to look at a question. So I haven't drifted off. I'm not falling asleep. So I am going to listen and see if there are any questions or if someone wants to open their mic at this point and start talking, that's fine too. If, if everybody's talking at once, we'll try to limit it to one person at a time, and I don't know how we're really gonna do that. Okay, Dr. McAdams, we have a question from Anne. She wants to know, are there any stats or thoughts on hereditary? Some people worry that they will get dementia if a parent has been diagnosed right. with it. And first off, thanks for the question. Thanks for, for attending tonight. There, there are two types of hereditary issues with uh, Alzheimer's. One of them is the early onset form where people have a genetic predisposition that they will get Alzheimer's. It's 50-50 just like that. That's an uncommon type of Alzheimer's, but it does occur. If there are family clusters that have that, you would know it because it's very early onset in the 40s and half of your family is going to be devastated by Alzheimer's at a very early age. Later onset Alzheimer's, does have some genetic markers that are similar. You know, there's markers on chromosome 21. There are markers on uh, chromosome or the apo allele repeat. So there are a few things that can be genetically tested, but they're not tested routinely simply because it's not always a fact that if you have this deficit or this this repeat that you're going to have problems with dementia. So there's not really a standard genetic test to develop to see if you develop dementia. You know, some of the like 23andMe, uh, the genetic testing you can get if you do the medical part, it'll do the APO allele A3, A4, and see if you've got the repeat of that. But even if you do, it doesn't mean that you're doomed with depression. If you have parents with depression, your risks are higher than someone who doesn't have parents with, or excuse me, parents with dementia, your risks are higher than if you didn't have parents with dementia, but it's not anything that's going to guarantee you that you're going to get it. The biggest, absolute biggest risk factor for dementia is age. The older you are, the higher your risk. At age 65, you've got about a 10 to 15% risk. By the age of 85, your risk is up at about the 40% chance that you will develop a, uh, an Alzheimer's type dementia. So good news is people are living longer. Bad news is people are living longer because now they're developing dementias that we would have never known. And sometimes you talk about family history. You know, two generations ago, people didn't live to be 85, 90 years of age. You know, people were dying in their 60s and you were looking at someone who might not have developed dementia yet and really never knew that it ran in your family. That's why the early onset you would know because it was in the 40s. So just because you had a mom and a dad that had it doesn't mean you're going to get it. 
doing some of the things to develop cognitive reserve, taking care of your heart, are going to minimize your risk as much as possible. Okay, that gets us into the next question. You, I think you kind of answered it. She said, uh, Kathy says, my parents both have dementia. Mom is in a nursing home and dad is actually at Laureate. And her mom also had dementia. So are my chances higher of getting the same disease? I'm a 62-year-old female. Higher, yes. Uh, dead solid sense, no. So at 62, uh, I randomly saw something, I don't know if it's in the Tulsa world that shows now up to the age 69 is considered middle age. So 62 is certainly not old because I'm going to be 61. So 62 is not old. So you have, you know, parents that have it again, you know, doing things that you can do to see, get your cognitive reserve up, to be healthy with your heart, to do your exercise, to do things along those lines can be important. But certainly, if you didn't have parents with dementia, your risk of having dementia would be less. And it's not a percentage I can give you. Like one parent, you've got an 8% chance. Two parents, you've got a 22% chance. There are just not enough numbers out there to say that you have this percentage of chance of getting dementia compared to the general population versus that percentage of chance with two parents. Okay, Cecilia asks, is the pathology behind vascular dementia the same as in heart disease? Yes, the, 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 the small vessels the, in the brain are affected. So when you look at small vessels in the heart, you know, the coronary arteries is what clogs up. Compared to the small vessels in the brain, they're actually big. So by the time you have, you know, a heart attack or have to have a stent, you've had a lot of clogging in that big artery, which probably means you've got clog clogging in the little arteries. And certainly things that increase those chances is what I talked earlier. Smoking increases those chances. High blood pressure increases those chances. Diabetes really, really, really increases those chances. So making sure that you control your metabolics is important. Exercise is important. But the pathology, yes. Cholesterol, you know, in, in Oklahoma, I always refer to, you know, the gravy factor. You ate a lot of gravy, although really now they, they've kind of started to believe and show that oral intake of cholesterol is not as important as what your genetics are. So if you've got bad genetics, bad heart disease in your family, you know, that's probably because your liver and is not clearing cholesterol like it should. And so those are people who need to be on statins. Those are people who need to get in early and get that heart disease in check, get that cholesterol in check, get those lipids straightened out and making sure that they get that part of that uh, equation taken care of as quickly as they can. Very good. Thank you. The second part of Cecilia's question, she asked, can you address if plaque and tangles is, this, is still the underlying issue in Alzheimer's or has it changed? <laughs> well, that's a question. And, you know, right now we're hopeful that's the underlying pathology. One of the newer drugs that's, that's in final stages is technically a the equivalent of a vaccine. It goes in and gets rid of the plaques and tangles. So if that's going to be the case, we'll see if people have an improvement after the plaques and tangles are removed, then the plaques and tangles are going to be part of it. You know, the scary part is what if they don't? And, you know, we've spent all of this time and money on, you know, thinking the plaques and tangles are the, are the bottom line pathology of this and it ends up being something else. You know, there have been a lot of drugs over the past several years that just have never gotten out of trials because they didn't work. When you look at uh, Alzheimer's, we'll just use Alzheimer's, you know, the amyloid precursor proteins are cut in certain ways by our body, beta secretase, which is an enzyme, and gamma secretase, which is an enzyme, and they cut them in certain ways. So I, I will tell you, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an analogy here. You know, people tend to fold towels a certain way, and they fold towels a certain way because they fit in a certain spot. So you fold them and trifold them or you roll them and they go where they're supposed to go. Our body is the same way. Beta secretase cuts it in a certain spot. Gamma secretase cuts it in a certain spot. And when that amyloid protein gets cut in the right spots, it fits and gets taken care of by the body. Unfortunately, some people, it starts cutting it in the wrong spot. So suddenly you've got a towel that doesn't fit anywhere and it starts to clog stuff up. And that's where the plaques come from and the towel proteins start to develop after the plaques develop. So, you know, they've looked at medications who, you know, stop beta and secretase, uh, gamma secretase from working correctly. 
and it didn't change anything. So I think, you know, it's going to be something that's going to be interesting to find out if that's the, the bottom line psych or uh, pathology of Alzheimer's. You know, I hope I kind of hope it is because we spend a lot of time and energy in trying to get that taken care of. And if it's not, as the old saying goes, I'll be back to the to the drawing board, to try to figure out where the pathology is. And the other thing is going to be how early on do you need to start these medications? You know, they have an ability through a, a uh, radionucleotide scan or PET scan to look at how much beta amyloid you have in your brain, even before you might develop any symptoms. And so, you know, when do you need to start the drug? Do you need to start the drug before symptoms? Do you need screening for beta amyloid and start the drug? You know, I don't, they haven't started looking at that yet to, to look at timing. They're simply looking at people who have excess beta amyloid and they're giving them medicine, clearing the beta amyloid, and they'll do post-testing after that. I don't really know how far out this is. It probably is several years still before they're able to finish these. The, the recruiting for the, uh, the study was very slow because it, it, it required a lumbar puncture, it required a lot of testing that people just really don't want to sign up for because it was a little intrusive. Next. That looks like it was our last question. Oh my goodness. If, oh, oh, hang on. Has vascular dementia been increasing due to American lifestyle, diet, smoking? Well, yes, and, and vascular, vascular dementia is also increasing because of length of uh, people living because it's a cumulative effect. But you're right, you know, lifestyle plays a big role in heart disease, plays a big role in diabetes, plays a big role in, in a lot of those illnesses that contribute to that. So it's one of those things that, you know, American lifestyle, but there are other countries that kind of have a, a bit of things, which, you know, I, I, I should throw in, you know, we talked about, you know, altitude and what you can do. The other thing you can do is, is, you know, certain types of diets might be beneficial, high good fats, low cholesterol, or low uh, dairy, low red meat. I always tell people to kind of eat like a bear, a lot of nuts and berries, a lot of foliage, you know, spinaches, greens, kales, things along those lines. And if you're eating protein, fish is your best, chicken is your second best. And with fish, I'm not talking about fried catfish, I'm talking about some deep water fish with omega-3s in it that uh, can do that. There's the, called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. You can look that one up on the internet. You can also look up just a, a Mediterranean diet. So you would probably think that people that live around the Mediterranean should have a very, very low instance of Alzheimer's, but unfortunately it's about the same. And it's probably because if you've ever been to Rome or you've been to Italy or Greece, they smoke like chimneys over there. Everybody smokes. So they're kind of wiping out the benefit of their red wine, their benefit of their uh, Mediterranean diet by smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. So again, that might be American lifestyle as well. Hopefully, you know, with all the money that's been spent on uh, the, uh, or the uh, smoking reduction things, then things are a little bit maybe turning in the right way. I don't know. I haven't looked at the stats on teenage smoking yet. Uh, recently to see if that's making an effect on anything, seeing all those horrible things on those commercials of how people are affected by cigarettes. It's pretty bad. Okay, Sherry, I, I'm reading that. Did I understand you to say that drugs such as quetiapine should not be given? No, you didn't understand me. I, I said they have a black box warning. Unfortunately, they're the best option for people who have psychosis and people who have agitation associated with dementia. They're not FDA approved. They're, they're, a, they're a medicine that you use a little bit down the, I wouldn't say last resort, but they're certainly something that you don't start out with when you're treating someone with dementia. So, you know, it's not that you can't give them, it's just this should be used with caution and used a little bit more at the last, towards the last to kind of control things. So quetiapine, olanzapine, risperidone, uh, all of those types of medications, uh, the atypical or second generation antipsychotics are the things that are used the most. There's actually one of those that's being studied now for agitation associated with dementia. It's in its final final throw and it looks like it probably at some point will get an approval, approvable letter that will be sent to the FDA. And then it'll be the FDA's decision to whether the benefits of the, treating the agitation outweighs the risks of that 1.6 to 1.7 percent chance that it can cause a mortality, I mean, death. It's not a side effect, it's death. And the death usually is due to aspiration pneumonia, heart, heart problems, or strokes.
Okay, Kathy has a question. What does a few scattered T2 flare hyperintensities within the paraventricular and subcortical white matter mean? Well, someone's been looking on their my chart and reading their MRI reports. <laughs> you know, here, here's the bottom line with that. It probably means there's some mild vascular problems. Usually paraventricular stuff, anytime you see something around the ventricles of the brain that is high intensity uh, white matter, it usually has to do with circulation. And it's probably one of those early signs that vascular might be something you need to consider. But just because you have that doesn't mean you're demented. Uh, but it can be something that if you see that combined with some other symptoms, then vascular dementia would kind of climb up the, the list of possibilities of why you're having those problems. Okay, Linda has a good question. Do you recommend seeing a neurologist when suspecting dementia? You know, you can see a neurologist. Uh, most of your internist primary care doctors can at least get the ball rolling. Diagnostically, they can do most of the testing. Neurologists can, can do most of the testing. The one area that you might have to see someone outside neurology, psychiatry, is if you need pen and paper testing like neuropsychiatric testing, then you have to see a neuropsychologist. And it can be beneficial early on to kind of get a, a baseline of where your cognition is. So it can be followed over a year or two to see which way it's headed. And if it doesn't head down, then it's probably not dementia. Those are we folks that you'd have to get a referral to go see. It's, a, you know, it's pen and paper testing, usually about a half a day, kind of puts you through the paces to look at that. Most, uh, most of the time when you see someone in their outpatient clinic, they'll have a little bit of pen and paper testing. It might be something as simple as drawing a clock. They'll give you a piece of paper, want you to draw a clock, put all the numbers in it where they go, and then they'll tell you what time to put it. A lot of times before that, they'll have you uh, register three words, Apple Table Penny, draw the clock, and then ask you to remember the words. If you do it all perfectly, the likelihood of you having any sort of uh, diagnosable neurocognitive deficit is pretty slim. If you miss one word, pretty slim. If you mess up a little bit on the clock, pretty slim. But if you miss a word, mess up on the clock, miss two words, mess up on the clock, then that means you need to have a little bit harder look at what might be going on because dementia is a little bit higher up on the list of probabilities at that point. Okay, Marty asks, how many years on average from the beginning of dementia? I, I'm guessing that the rest of that question is how many years does someone live after the diagnosis of dementia? I'm going to answer it in a couple different ways because I really don't know what you what you meant. Typically, the diagnosis of dementia comes about three years after the onset of symptoms. That's what I mean. That's that delay of just saying, oh, he's just forgetful. Oh, you know, we just remind him. Oh, he set up his medicine. So the delay of that. So usually it's a three-year delay in the time from symptom starting to someone actually seeking help for it, which is three years that you could be taking medicines that can make those three years like four years or five years. From the, the diagnosis of dementia to death is typically about eight years. Now that's average. So everybody knows what averages are. There's some 12 years in there. There's some three years in there, some four years in there. Typically, most people with dementia, most people with dementia die of whatever they were going to die of, whether it's a stroke, whether it's a heart attack. The two areas that increase mortality in people with dementia are accidents, falls, getting out into traffic, get run over, doing something. You know, I've, I've had people that have shot themselves accidentally. I've had people who shot their spouses because they didn't recognize them. So accidents and stuff. And the other one is pneumonia and infection because the, as you get dementia, your swallowing mechanism gets a little bit off and you're more easy to get choked and get something down the wrong pipe. And you end up with a, a rapid onset of strep pneumo or strep pneumonia. It's very quick. It's very lethal. It causes sepsis very quickly, and it's something that'll get you quick. So infection, primarily aspiration pneumonia, and accidents will shorten that. But average age or average duration is about eight years. Okay. Douglas is asking, does a drink of wine a day, is that very helpful? Well, you know, it's it's not hurtful. It's not hurtful, but but jokingly, it depends on how big the drink is. You know, a, a glass of wine is six ounces. That's a standard drink of wine. Mo there are a lot of studies that'll show two drinks a day is beneficial. 
Now, there might be reasons that you shouldn't drink two a day if you've got some form of liver disease or you've got a potential of falls that two drinks a day intoxicate you. It doesn't necessarily have to be wine. It can be vodka. It can be whiskey. But two drinks is kind of the max. Now, I say that, but there have been studies in Europe and Britain that show two drinks a day in women increases the risk of colon cancer. So, again, you know, pick your poison, pick your way. But wine, you know, you always hear red wine's good for you. You know, it has tannins in it that can be good for you. That's another thing about that Mediterranean diet. You know, people in Europe, Rome and Spain, I mean, they love a glass of wine. They love a red wine. So, you know, drinking in moderation, two drinks a day is something that is certainly not frowned upon. As long as there's no medical reason you can't do it, it's not increasing any fall risk. It's not doing anything like that. Again, though, an ounce and a half is a drink of uh, alcohol. Six ounces is a drink of wine and 12 ounces is a beer. So again, you know, balancing all of that out, if you can get by with two glasses of something, then that's that that's acceptable. And I notice more and more when I'm discharging people to assisted living programs, there is a question on their discharge on their admit orders. Can a person can they consume alcoholic beverages? Because a lot of these newer, fancier uh, facilities, they'll have a bar that they can go down and get a drink. Monero has a beautiful bar. And so, you know, but they have to have, if they're in assisted living and go to that, they have to have a note that says it's okay that they do that or that they're served wine at dinner. So salute, enjoy your wine. <laughs> okay. Cecilia asks, I believe that La Cunar bodies are different than Louis bodies, Yep. but do La Cunar bodies also lead to dementia? Yeah, I don't, I, I, and Karen is not medical. It's lacuner. 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 Sorry. That's fine. <laughs> so they're called lacuner because they look like quarter moons. They're they're a a, a crescent, or more like crescent moons. They look like crescent moons, and they're signs in the brain of vascular problems that you've had lacuner infarcts or lacuner strokes. Depending on where that lacuner stroke has, you might not even know you had it. Might not even know you had it. And that's why when you insist on that workup, part of that workup or part of that diagnostic workup is some sort of imaging of your brain, whether it be an MRI or whether it be a CAT scan, because you want to look for these sort of things because it gives you more diagnostic specificity in saying that this is a vascular dementia. So lacunar infarcts are not the same as Lewy bodies. Lewy bodies are not visible on a CT scan. They're not visible on an MRI. They're not visible on a PET scan. They're only visible on autopsy. So when you have an autopsy of your brain, they'll stain it and they'll see the Lewy inclusion bodies that are diagnostic of Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's dementia. Okay, how should the refusal of food by someone with Alzheimer's be handled? Well, I, you know, I always hate to say it depends, but it always depends. You know, it depends on where they are in their illness. You know, if this is end stage or profound Alzheimer's, where they're in bed, whether they are, you know, capable of, of telling you what they want and what they don't want, that's part of that early, early legal planning that you should do. Maybe this is the time where you call in hospice because they won't eat anymore. So if it's later on, if it's a stubborn thing where they just don't want to eat, and not just not forgot how to eat. It's always one, look at what they're eating, give them anything they want. Because at this point, it doesn't matter what their cholesterol is. It doesn't matter what their blood sugar is to a certain degree. So you give them what they want. If they want a bowl of ice cream, you give them a bowl of ice cream. If they want, you know, some pudding, you give them pudding. Anything that they will eat that has calories. I always used to joke, if you want to stick a butter and roll it in sugar and give it to them, give them a stick of butter roll in sugar because they just need the calories. They need something that's going to help them to maintain their body weight, to maintain their metabolism. So if it's late and you have an advanced directive that someone doesn't want to be fed with a tube or have IVs, then it might be time to call in hospice. If it's early, always try to find something they would eat. And if they want to eat at two in the morning and you're up, then feed them. If they don't want breakfast, don't force the food on them. Just put it there. The other thing is, as we talked earlier, they lose ability to, to functionally do things. So it's always better to try things that are finger foods that they can literally reach over with their hand and put in their mouth. Because when you think of your kid on his, in his high chair with his tray with some uh, Cheerios in front of him, him putting them in, picking them up, putting them in, picking them up, putting them in, that's it. I don't recommend that you, you know, although some people will eat if you feed them, you know, I don't always recommend that you try to force feed someone or fly the airplane into the hangar. But if that works, then by golly, do it. 
Okay, well, that looks like that was the last question in our chat box right. for this evening. I was going to let everybody know our next, we're going to do another virtual medical town hall event. It will be on dermatology and skin cancer on Tuesday, May 18th from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And you can register if you go to stfrancis.com events and you can get registered for that. Appreciate you all participating in this event and we'll see you next time. Thanks again. All right, thanks guys. I appreciate it. Hopefully some of my folks in Gracemont were able to log on. I have no idea if they were. If you are there, thanks for tuning in. Good night. Bye-bye.